sense. It's like we wiped out everybody. Nobody was left alive. Not a single person breathing, nothing. It's like, well, obviously that wasn't the case because people would have escaped beforehand. They would have escaped during the battle. And in fact, some survivors came back and refortified the city. So we know that they're using a, a phrase or an expression or a way of speaking that's appropriate to the genre of the time. So that's interesting, but that's not the way we're going to read the book. We're going to read the way the church fathers read it, which is a spiritual analogy for your life. And, and we're going to go through that, but first, before we do that, we need to know what the book says so that then we can get the proper spiritual interpretation from it, okay? So if we look at the book of Joshua, there's a very basic outline uh, that we have, which is the first five chapters are preparations to enter the promised land, okay? So we'll talk a little about that. The second piece is conquering the land. That's chapters 6 through 12, so all the different battles that happen. After the battles in chapter 13 and 21, if you got to that point, there's a lot of names of cities and towns and all kinds of uh, people uh, because they're dividing the land among the 12 tribes. Okay, so um, a lot of that geography lesson is very interesting, but we don't have time for it because this is Bible basics, not Bible advanced. Okay, and then the last part, the last... Uh, 22 through 24, those chapters are the final exhortation to Israel to obey so they can keep the promised land and not lose it. Okay, so that's the basic structure of the book. Um, I hope if you read it, you can, it's, it's fairly enjoyable. There's, there's some neat story material in it. Um, but what we're going to find as we go through the book, there's a lot of spiritual fruit we can draw out of this. We want to we look at this. The first thing we want to see is that to get into the promised land, they have to do some preparation work first. So let's look at what they do to prepare. Okay. So this is a chapter one, what they do first. God prepares Joshua by speaking to him. And he says three times in the first chapter, be strong and of good courage. This is chapter one, verse six. So chapter five, chapter one, verse five, it says, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and of good courage for you shall cause this people to inherit the land. I swore to their fathers to give them only be strong and courageous. So a second time he's saying it. And then it goes down and it says, talks about the book of the law. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. That's from Psalm 1. Okay, so we're going to see that theme. And then have I not commanded you in verse 9, be strong and of good courage. So do you think they need to be strong and courageous? Yes, he's repeating it. And then he even says it at the very last verse of chapter 1, whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your word, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Okay, so here we have, if you're strong and courageous in the Lord, you're going to be victorious because I promised it and I'm going to do it. Okay, so it's a spiritual preparation. Um, the first, what they do, they send spies into the land, just like Moses did in the beginning before they went into exile in the, in the desert for 40 years, sent spies into the land and the spies go to Jericho and they stay with a lady whose name is Rahab the harlot. Okay, now we're going to come back to her. Okay. But what we're going to see is that from Rahab's perspective, they know what Israel is all about. They've heard stories, okay? So that helps us to understand the conquest of the promised land because it's not like Israel comes in and just starts wiping people out like, what the heck, man? You know, the fact is, is that they heard what God did in Egypt. They heard what God did in the Red Sea. They heard all these things and Rahab wants a part of that. So she asked to come in, and we're going to see some other people want to come in, but the vast majority of the rest of the people are wiped out because they stubbornly resist God, okay? So this is a divine judgment on people's wickedness. It's not a surprise, okay? So we just want to keep that in mind, okay? But we see the principal way that Israel fights is spiritually. They got to pray. And so to do that, to have the right mind, they have to first pass through the Jordan. So it's a type of baptism. They have to pass through the Red Sea to get into the, to, to the, to Mount Sinai. They have to pass through the Jordan to go into the Promised Land. And then they are circumcised. Now, this is kind of interesting because Moses did not do this. Isn't that fascinating? Right? So as we look at the difference between Moses and Joshua, we notice a few very important points. The first is Moses, his leadership is not so great because the people really rebel pretty much his, the whole time, right? They're not obedient. Whereas Joshua, with one exception, people do what he says. So he's a much more effective leader, okay? That's one. Secondly, Moses doesn't circumcise the second generation, which is a huge oversight. Uh, he had 40 years to do it and he didn't do it. So you're like, what, what's going on there? So Moses didn't do that. But Joshua then rectifies that situation and circumcises them before they go into battle. Because saying, if we're going to be the people of God, we need to obey what he says. So they do that. 
Lastly, of course, Moses famously could not bring them into the promised land where Joshua does. Now, with just this little bit of comparison, you can see that there is a, that Joshua is a better leader, but what's really important about this is the name Joshua, okay? The name Joshua in Hebrew is Yeshua, which, if you put it through the Greek, becomes Jesus, right? So Joshua is a type of Jesus. Okay, remember we talked about typology, right? We're going to talk about typology again. Types are shadows of future things, right? They are anticipations. They're dim images, right, of what's going to be revealed later. Remember the Passover was a type of the mass, right? Yeah, the Exodus, it's a type of of baptism. You pass through the Red Sea, just like you, and you're freed from your enemies. You pass through the waters of baptism, you're set free from slavery to sin and death, okay? So we see there's now typology between Moses and the old law and Jesus. Moses couldn't get the people to behave, right? He gave them the law, but didn't give them the power to carry it out. Jesus, however, gives the new law and the power of the Holy Spirit, and they're able to be obedient to God. We see that Moses was not only unable to circumcise them physically, he couldn't circumcise their hearts, but Jesus circumcises the heart through the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, right? And then lastly, we see Moses and the old law were not able of themselves to bring the people into the, the true life of freedom, whereas Jesus, the new Joshua, brings people into the promised land of heaven. Okay, you see that? So, so again, there's a lot more rich things, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. Okay, all right. So before they can come into the promised land and conquer it, they have to pass through the Jordan River, they have to be circumcised, and then they celebrate the Passover. So this is what they do uh, in chapter uh, five. It's actually kind of funny uh, because uh, so many people are circumcised. It is in, in chapter 5, verse 3. It says, Joshua, he, he circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Haraloth, which in Hebrew means the hill of the foreskins. Okay? There's so, so anyway, there's just so many of people who were uncircumcised. It's kind of a, a terrible image. But anyway, um, but, but basically it's the entire second generation who were not circumcised yet. So now they enter into the covenant. And after that, after three days... Uh, they, they keep the Passover, this is verse 10. While they were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, in the evening of the plains of Jericho. And the next day of the Passover, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain, and the manna ceased on the next day. This was a promise of God. You're going to eat manna until you are in the promised land and eat its fruits. So now they've eaten the first meal in the promised land, and the bread from heaven now stops. Isn't that amazing? It has been constant bread from heaven for 40 years. We forget that, right? Isn't that incredible? Like, it's just so amazing. And you're like, well, these ding-dongs, how do they not get this right? Because they're hard of heart, right? So Joshua is, is starting to undo that, and that's it's really important. So then after that faithfulness of them being circumcised and celebrating the Passover as the Lord commanded, now Joshua has a vision of an angel. Who do you think that angel is? So let's look at this. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lives in verse 13, chapter 5. He lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, a man stood before him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or our adversaries? He said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord of hosts, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, worshiped and said to him, what does the Lord bid his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, put off your shoes from your feet for the place you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So angel holding a sword, who does that look like? Yes, yes, it is St. Michael. And, the, and this is important, we recognize Jewish tradition, St. Michael is the angel of the Jewish people, right? So not only the commander of the Lord of hosts, but the particular protector and patron of the Jewish nation, okay? So it makes complete sense. Not, it's not just a Catholic thing we're throwing in there. This is actually what the Jewish rabbis believed also, right? Okay, very cool. So now they're gonna go in uh, to Jericho. Before we do that though, what I'm gonna do um, is I'm just gonna turn this over because pretty much we're not going to go necessarily in order chronologically but we're going to go thematically through some of these images that you read about okay and okay there we go okay so i mentioned there's lots of lots of typology that's happening here first of all the battle for the land is an image of the spiritual life okay God gave them particular commandments. What was one of the commandments he gave? Were they supposed to take any prisoners? No. Were they supposed to intermarry with anybody? No. Could they take any of the possessions from the land? No. He said, destroy everything. Do not intermarry. Do not mix with them. Why is that? 
because he didn't want them to become like them, right? He didn't want them to abandon the faith. He knew that they were weak, and if they intermarried, if they took possessions, if they made alliances with the enemies of God, they would become just like them. And in fact, that's what happens. So God's fears are not unfounded. He kind of knows us, right? And so the fact is, it's an image of the spiritual life. Those three things that God commanded them to do are the threefold concupiscence. It's a big word, but it means that's what happened at the fall, right? We were tempted by lust of the flesh, which is a desire for pleasure, lust of the eyes, which is greed and wanting more, and pride of life, which is our, our, our own will, right? So what does he say? Don't intermarry. That's lust of the flesh. You can't just have any woman you want. You can't just have any relationship you want. You need to be pure and holy to the Lord, right? Secondly, don't take any of the stuff. Don't desire what they have. So how often is it we're like, man, if I could just be like that superstar, if I could just be like this person, I, don't desire it. It's death. Possessions will never make you happy, right? Thirdly, you need to do what I say, right? You need, even though you're like, oh, that's really harsh. Like, do what I say because obedience to the will of God is our peace, right? If I'm going to disobey, then it's going to be chaos in my spiritual life, okay? Right? So now we see Rahab. I mentioned her in, in, the, in chapter 2 when the spies go to Jericho. Rahab is a really fascinating character because, well... She's a harlot, so she's a, she's a cult prostitute. So it's not exactly she's not exactly a virtuous lady in her past. But what she does is she wants to follow God. She's heard of this God. She's heard of this people, and she wants to be a part of it. And so she saves the spies' lives, and in exchange, asks that they would spare her when they come to destroy Jericho. And so they make a deal with her. They say, yes, we will do that as long as you keep us safe and you don't betray us. Tie this scarlet cord from the window and anybody who's in your house, we will not destroy it. But if they step outside the house, they're going to die, right? So that scarlet cord out of the window, does that remind you of anything? The Passover, the blood on the door that protects anybody who's inside. So it looks backward, but it also looks forward, right, to Christ, right? who redeems the house of God through his blood, and anybody inside of it is safe. That's the image of the church. So the house of Rahab the harlot becomes an image of the church. And Jericho becomes an image of the world that will be destroyed on the last day at the last judgment. And isn't it interesting that there are trumpets? Right? That's what this promise, that the Lord will come on the last day amid a loud trumpet blast and a loud shout. And indeed, that's what happens. There's a shouting and trumpets and the walls fall down and the city's utterly destroyed, except for the house of Rahab. So on the last day, those who are in the church, those who are in the household of God, protected by the blood of the Lamb, will not face the destruction of the last day but everyone else will. That's why we need to proclaim the gospel to the world to say, get in the house. Get in the house of God. Don't be a fool and remain outside of it, right? You see all the spiritual stuff that's here? Okay. Now, what's even cooler about this is that Rahab, um, she actually becomes an ancestor of the Lord Jesus and King David. So if you turn with me to Matthew chapter one, this is the gospel of Matthew. So the very first book of the New Testament. the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, you'll notice when you get to chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Oh, holy moly, an outsider is now in the promised land. She was not a Jew. She's brought into the family of God and into the lineage of the Messiah. That's quite a turnaround, isn't it? Someone who began their life as a prostitute is now the ancestor of the great King David and Joseph, the husband of Mary. Isn't that amazing? See God's mercy in this. No matter where you have been in your life, if you will repent and believe in the Lord Jesus and follow him, he can make your life amazing. Amazing, right? That's, that's such good news, isn't it? It's just like, it's so good. So good. Anyway, so Rahab, uh, she, she becomes part of, of the family of God. All right, great. My notes are all getting messed up here. Anyway, we'll continue here. The second thing that we see is in Jericho itself. I'll come back to the Gibeonites for a minute. In Jericho itself, as I mentioned, was an image of the last judgment. But the way Israel fights is not with regular weapons, is it? It's by liturgical procession. 
They put the ark on their shoulders and they follow behind it and they blow trumpets. And they don't do anything else for seven days. So let's look at this. This is in chapter six. This is God's commandment. The Lord said to Joshua, verse two, see, I've given into your hand Jericho with his king and mighty men. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once, thus shall you do for six days. And seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, priests blowing the trumpets. As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people will shout with a great shout. The wall of the city will go down flat. And the people shall go up every man straight before him. So the Lord's saying, don't bring any weapons to the battle. It's just going to be the ark and the trumpets. And then at the last day, you're going to shout and the walls will fall down. Remember this when when God gave a command to Moses and he said, speak to the rock and it'll bring forth water. You're like, that's, that's crazy. How can that happen, right? But the, Moses disobeys, right? And he's kept out of the promised land. But now the Lord is saying, no, shout to the wall and it'll fall over. And they obey him and it happens. And see how God's glory is manifested through their obedience to the command of God, right? Prayer has great power, friends. We got to realize that prayer is great power. Without raising a single siege work, they bring down the city. And so often we look at our life, we look at all of the things that are just so difficult and so fortified. And we're like, there's no way we can bring that down. We're outnumbered. We don't have the right weapons. We don't have the right tools. We're totally unequipped. God says, trust in me. Be obedient. And I will be victorious in this, right? Amazing. Anyway, so Jericho, we see, we see that their liturgical procession for seven days, this images their feast days because a lot of the Jewish feasts are seven days. So this is like a feast of the Lord's justice. Really amazing, right? So it's a liturgical act that they do. And because they are faithful to the liturgical command of the Lord, their enemies spiritually are defeated. That's what we see spiritually happening here. It's also a type of the seven sacraments, which overcome all the enemies of our souls, right? So the fathers saw tons of great fruit from this story of Jericho. Right Now we go back uh, to the Gibeonites. So after Jericho is uh, defeated, they have their next battle. Okay. And uh, what, what happened here is, is, is a little bit of a problem. So uh, this is chapter 7. The sons of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. So remember God said, destroy everything, don't take anything. One of the dudes is like, eh, that's nice, I'll take that. You know, just put it in my pocket over here, you know. And so nobody knows. It's secret. It's hidden. They go to their next battle and they lose. And they're like, God, what's going on here? And God says, someone is disobedient. And so by revelation, it's revealed who this guy is and he's put to death. And you're like, well, that's, that's really strong. But remember what they've been through. Remember all of the stuff they have seen. And if somebody is that stupid to disobey God directly after hearing the explicit command, don't touch this stuff, their heart is hard, right? And so we see that's what mortal sin does. It kills the life of grace in our soul when we stubbornly resist God, even though we know better, right? That's why mortal sin is so serious. And all the commands in Deuteronomy that we saw for the death penalty, they're all for mortal sins because it's that exact reason that somebody's heart has become shut off to grace. And God in his mercy cuts them off so that they don't continue to do more evil and get even worse off, right? It's a hard mercy, but it's, that's kind of the, the image that's there. Okay, so now continuing, after that happens, they're victorious. And now, after that next battle, um, they, they go ahead and they, they fulfill the covenant command of God. This is in chapter uh, 8, after they've uh, defeated the next city of Ai. In verse 30, Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal to the Lord as Moses of the servant of the Lord had commanded. So remember at the end of Deuteronomy, he says, when you get into the promised land, you're going to do this ritual, but it doesn't happen yet. So now it's happening. He gets on the mountain. They proclaim the covenant blessing on one side and the covenant curse on the other toward the people, right? So this happens. Now the covenant is ratified of Deuteronomy. And then we come to chapter 9. So at the end of chapter 8, it says, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded which Joshua did not read. So he's being, again, very faithful, scrupulously obedient to every word of God. All right? So we see Joshua being a type of Jesus, again, who completely fulfills the will of his father and doesn't leave out any command or any word of his. Right? So again, another point where there's an overlap. Okay? But now we come to chapter 9, we see the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites are a little devious. Their neighbors, they're pretty close by. They see what's going on and they go, we are gonna, we're cooked. We're gonna die. We need to do something. And so they 
put on old clothes, they put on old shoes, they're tattered and worn, they ruffle up their hair a little bit, they roll in the mud, a bit dirt, you know, and they take old moldy food and they pretend like they came on a really long journey, but it's really like a couple miles away, okay? And so they're like, oh, please, sir, we've traveled so far, we want a covenant with you. And they're like, are you really far away? Yes, sir, look, our food is all moldy and stuff. It was fresh when we left. And they're like, okay, sure, we believe you. <laughs> but it's, here's the reason why they, don't, they, they believe them. It says, okay, uh, this is in, in verse uh, 14. I basically, I summarized all that and I, I gave you the juicy parts. Okay, uh, chapter nine, verse 14. So the men partook of their provisions and did not ask direction from the Lord. There it is. They're like, oh, let's believe them. Let's not ask God if they might be lying to us, you know. No, we'll just do it. Remember, God said, don't make a covenant with anybody that you meet in the land, right? So this is an odd lapse in judgment there, right? They relied on their own understanding, and they made a mistake, okay? Because then they realize, oh, shoot, they're neighbors. At the end of three days, after they'd made a covenant with them, they heard that they were their neighbors. <laughs> like, oh, darn it. But now they're stuck. They made a covenant. Your word is good. They have to honor it. And so they do. But what's interesting about this, they're made slaves, but they're made servants of the priests, so what's actually interesting about this is that while they are devious, they're actually, they're not rewarded for being devious, right? Because remember Jacob, right? They're the father of the Israelites, Israel himself, he deceived his own father, didn't he, to get the blessing? So now it's kind of interesting. They're getting their own comeuppance a little bit. The Gibeonites are imitating Israel in deceiving Israel to get a blessing. And God honors that, not because they're lying, but because they have deep desire for God. They're willing to do anything to be a part of the covenant. And would that we had the same desire to be members of the church and to practice our faith, right? That we'd be willing to do anything to have God, right? Now, they're not rewarded for lying, as I said, but what is interesting is, is that now, for the rest of their life, they are closer to the holy things than all the rest of the tribes, except the Levites. Isn't that fascinating? They're outsiders, but they're actually, because of their desire and their, their effort that's come into the family, they're actually brought very close to the holy things. Isn't that interesting? How, again, God's mercy, bringing somebody who is far outside the family very close to him because God wants to be close to us and he's not, he's not, uh, he can overcome any of our limitations in our past, right? So he's not worried about your past. He just wants you to be with him. Amen? right? Good. As long as we repent, as long as we want to be part with him, he will take anyone who asks. And that's the good news, because remember, when we, when we looked at Deuteronomy, we thought it was really harsh. God says, wipe out everybody, wipe out everybody. Like, oh man, that's so hard. It's like, we see very clearly, if people want to repent, we have a couple examples that God doesn't have that requirement that it take care of everybody, right? You know, he'll, he'll, let, he'll let a few people accept into the family. So, good. All right, so that's, that's exciting. Now there's more Joshua and Jesus uh, analogies because now that they uh, have made a covenant with these people, they have to protect them, okay? And so in chapter 10, we have Adonai, Adonai, for crying out loud, my brain is not working, nor is my tongue. Just gotta write it out. Adonai, Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek. Did anybody else have a name that was Zedek? You remember any of that? Melchizedek, right? Who also was the king of Jerusalem, right? So Adonai, right, is the Lord, the Lord our righteousness. Isn't that interesting? So it seems like all of the kings of Jerusalem have this Zedek title. That's what, remember, we went back and said Melchizedek's not his real name. It's a title that's given to him, yes? We believe he's actually probably Shem in the Jewish understanding. But now Adonai Zedek is going to war against the, the, the Gibeonites and bringing five kings with him. And so they're like, please help us. We are your covenant people. And we're like, ugh, yes, okay, fine. So they go into battle. And of course, they're victorious. And the way they're victorious is really quite remarkable. This is in chapter 10, verse uh, 10. 
The Lord, so, so verse 9, Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them by the way of the scent at Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw down great stones from heaven upon them as far as Azekah, and they died. And there were more who died because of the hailstones than the men of Israel killed with the sword. Right? So we see very clearly, even in this battle, like Jericho, it's not because of their military might. It's because of God's intervention. Right? And then, this is the kicker, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the men of Israel. He said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon, and you moon in the valley of Ahilan. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed till the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Like, this is like a one little one-off, and then it's gone. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> The sun stood still, right, and didn't move until they finished the battle. Now, how are we to interpret that, right? Well, we don't, we don't know, <laughs> but it's kind of like um, if we look at the Joshua Jesus types here, Joshua speaks and the sun obeys him, right? When Jesus comes, the sea and the, the wind and all of nature obeys him. And when he dies on the cross, what happens? There's an eclipse of the sun for three hours. How long did the eclipse last when you guys watched it? <laughs> like a few, like a minute, right? Imagine an eclipse that lasted for three hours. Everyone would have thought the end of the world was upon us, right? So again, we see very clearly that Joshua, Jesus analogies are meant to be drawn. We don't see it until Jesus comes. We see very clearly some of this stuff is mysterious and we don't quite understand it, but it makes sense when Jesus, the real Joshua, comes. Okay. So the five kings are defeated, which was basically an alliance of the south. And then the kings of the north come by and they're like, oh my gosh, we got to take these people out. But of course they can't either. And Joshua's victorious. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much the, the first uh, and second parts of the outline that we had. You know, preparing them to enter the land, the conquest of the land. Then they divide up the land, which is super boring with all the names. Uh, but if you want to study that, uh, it's very interesting for later history of why there's all these territorial disputes. Because that's my land and that's your land and all these other things. So if you want to do more study in that, I encourage you to do that. But we won't do that tonight because some of you are falling asleep. Okay. All right. But essentially the point that they're drawing out over and over again is that God is giving a portion to everybody except the Levites. Over and over again it mentions this. We see this at the end of, for example, for crying out loud, different chapters. Okay, like chapter 13, for example. At the end of chapter 13, it says, to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel is their inheritance, as he said to them, right? So it says this two or three times. It says in, uh, again in uh, chapter 13 and verse 14, to the tribe of Levi alone, Moses gave no inheritance. The offerings by fire to the Lord God of Israel are their inheritance, right? So we see very clearly that he doesn't give them cities. He doesn't give them a part in the land because God is their inheritance. He doesn't give them sustenance because their sustenance comes from the offerings of the people, right? So that was, that was part of the deal. Okay. So once we get done dividing the land and getting the refuge cities and everything else that needed to happen, they make an altar of witness in chapter 22. And this is kind of a, this is kind of a, a, a controversy because uh, remember there were a couple of tribes that they didn't want to go into the promised land. They liked some of the parts that were outside. And so they said, okay, you can have this land, but you got to come in and help us fight. And when we're done, you can go back to the promised land. Okay. So they finished that. Now they can go back. But when they go back and cross the Jordan, they built an altar. And the, the Israelites, what are you doing? We were commanded to only have one altar, one central sanctuary. And so they come and they're about to do war with them. Because they're like, you guys are going to bring a curse upon us if you disobey God. We just obtained the promised time. We don't want to lose it. What are you doing? Okay. And so they give this response. This is in chapter 22. Uh, verse 26. Okay. So it said, Therefore, we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you, between the generations after us, that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings, lest your children say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. We thought, if this should be said to us, our descendants in time to come, we should say, behold, the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifice, but a witness between us and you. 
So they're like, they're covering themselves. They're like, look, we know that the sacrifice is only going to be offered in the promised land. But we, just because we don't live in the promised land, doesn't mean we're not faithful. We're going to be faithful. We built this altar just to remind ourselves of it. We're not going to actually offer anything on it. We'll see if that happens throughout the Bible. Interesting. <laughs> but they said it. So, phew, all right, we're good here. No problem. And so they're now in peace. And now Joshua's an old dude. So he's old and advanced in years. He dies when he's 110. So before he dies, um, he gives a final exhortation. And it's, it begins essentially in chapter 23. This is verse, verse 2. Joshua summoned all Israel, elders and heads, their judges, officers, and said to them, I'm now old and well advanced, and you've seen all the Lord your God has done to these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who fought for you. Behold, I allotted you an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations I've already cut off from the Jordan to the Great Sea. So we see that they did a lot, but there's more to do. Okay, so this is, this is important drama for the rest of the Bible, saying they drove out a lot, but there's still a lot of people left. Okay, and so they didn't, and they didn't completely do the job, and so that's going to cause some problems later on. Okay, so then Joshua, Joshua's reminding them of all the promises. He says, therefore, be very steadfast, in verse 6, to keep and do all that's written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor the left. You may not be mixed with the nations left here among you or make mention of the names of their gods, swear by them or serve them or bow down before them, but cling to the Lord your God as you've done this day. The Lord's driven out before you great and strong nations. As for you, no man's been able to withstand you this day. Okay. Take heed to yourselves, verse 11, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and join the remnant of these nations left here among you, make marriages with them, so you marry their women and they yours, know assuredly the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations before you. But they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a scourge for your sides, thorns in your eyes, till you perish from the land which the Lord has given you. Okay. All right. And so then he reminds them of the curses, etc., for transgression of the covenant. And then goes through the history of the Exodus, and actually before then, so this is chapter 24, he starts with Abraham, says, remember, thus says Lord your God, your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, they served other gods, they took Abraham from on the river, so it goes from Abraham all the way to the present day. So remember what God's done, not just in the Exodus, but all the way since the beginning with the blessing of Abraham to now. That's really important. If you don't remember it, why are we doing this, right? How did we get here? That's why it's really important that we study the scriptures because friends, you are part of this history now too. Here in 2023, here in Springfield, Oregon, this is your story. It's not just something that happened to the Jewish people. It is yours and you need to know it because if you don't, then you can be seduced by the moment and think, oh, my life's terrible. Maybe I should just go back to Egypt. Maybe I should just be on my phone all day. Maybe I should do whatever, fill in the blank and not do what God asks. It's a deception and a lie. We need to keep the word of God before our eyes always and in our minds so that we know what the truth is and what God has done and what he continues to do, okay? And therefore, when we remember what he's done, then he says, fear the Lord. This is in chapter 4, 24, excuse me. Chapter 24, darn it, which, where is it? Ah, 24, verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the river and serve the Lord. And if you be unwilling to serve him, choose this day who you will serve. This is great leadership. Because it's saying, you know what? I've told you all this stuff. You've seen all of it. But if you don't want it, you're free to go. And I have to say that to all of, all of us here. Because I know there's some people who are here. I know some of you young people, you don't want to be here. And I know that. It's okay. But you're here. So I'd ask you to give it your all. How many, I, I'm just going to ask just real quick. Those who want to be here, could you stand up? Just everybody here. Who wants to be here? Could you stand up? I want you to just look around. I want you to look around. Just recognize this, right? Encourage each other. If, you're, if, if it's hard for you to pay attention, right? Encourage one another. Because this is good stuff. This is life-saving stuff. You have to choose because I've chosen to give my life for it, but I can't make you choose it. You've got to say, is this credible? Do I believe it? Do I want it? It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to require that you root out all this stuff from your life that doesn't belong to God. And some of you won't want to do it. It's going to require everything. And I don't want to... To, to lay out a, a, a picture that's rosy, to say it's going to be easy. No, it isn't. You're going to have to suffer for this, 
right? And that's why Joshua, he warns me, says, if you don't want to do this, it's okay. Go right now. It's better that you go right now, right, than that you pretend to follow the Lord. Don't pretend to follow him. Actually follow him because it does no good to pretend to follow him, right? You can all be seated. It's fine. So now that you know that everybody wants to be here with standing up, if you see them squirreling off, you can tell them, hey, you want to be here, right? I'm dead serious, right? Because the fact is, is that, like, I would have killed to have this stuff when I was growing up. I would have killed to have it, right? But the fact is, is that God allowed me to suffer in the desert without it for a long time to teach me the value of it. This is a word of life, brothers and sisters. And you're free to accept it or reject it. It's yours. It's your heritage. I'm inviting you all into it. I hope, I hope that you will, you will accept it as a good word for you. Right? It's difficult sometimes to understand, but friends, it's life. Look at all these people, and look at our world right now. <laughs> Are we any different than them? The reason we keep doing the same stupid stuff is because we don't know our sacred history. If you know it, you can recognize the lies when they come that say, oh, it's just a little bit of gold over here. It's just a little bit of thing over here. Oh, it's just a relationship over here. It doesn't matter, right? It absolutely does matter. Because obedience to the Lord gives life disobedience and we're exiled from our land. And we're very close to being exiled from the world. We just got to pray right now, friends. We got to pray for the end to all the violence that's happening and the, and the warmongering that's happening. World War III is not what any of us want. But it's, people are beating down the doors for it for some stupid reason. Why? I don't understand. But it's because of our sin and our greed. And we also repent of this. It's not new stuff. It's old stuff that keeps rearing its head over and over again. We look at all the sexual perversion in our world and we just have to say this is not new. It's when people decide I'm going to do whatever I want and I don't want anybody telling me what to do that we get crazy stuff. You can choose to live in that world if you want to. But I'm inviting you to live in the house of the church. You can live like Rahab the harlot before her conversion or after. One will be destroyed with the final judgment, with the trumpet blast on the last day. The other will be saved. And in fact, if you choose to live in faithfulness to the Lord now, even now you'll have a taste of heaven. Even now you'll receive the taste of freedom that the Lord offers to you. So the question I give to you is, will you serve him? Will you serve him? As for me and my house, says Joshua, we will serve the Lord. But everyone must make that their own. So we're going to break up now into our, into our groups. And I just have two questions, or maybe three. Pretty simple. We have a little bit more time for, for questions today, but I'll make sure our timekeeper comes and, and just rings bell for us at right about at 7, 735, 740, just so we can gather back for, for Q&A. But I really want us to just take some time with these questions. Are you convinced of the power of prayer in your own life? Do you pray? Or do you only pray when you need something, right? So first question is about prayer. Like, are you, are you convinced that prayer accomplishes all things? Have you seen it work that way in your life? And if so, what's your prayer life like? So that's the first question. The second question is, is there anything or anyone or any activity that's keeping you a slave? And are you willing to make the sacrifice necessary to get rid of those things to serve the Lord? So big questions tonight, right? But I want us to take some time with that because this is, this is really, this is really the, the case. Like some of us, I, I think we want to, we have the idea that we want to, but when push comes to shove, I'm not ready to give it up yet. It's okay to admit that. But then we have to ask the question, do I like that? <laughs> do I like that about myself or do I need help? In which case, I know good news, there's somebody who can liberate you. There is someone who can set you free and give you new life. And it is Yeshua it is Jesus, our Savior. All right, let's go ahead and break. And uh, uh, youth have their small groups kind of up here. Um, the adults that have been asked or, or anyone, you know, who would like to help us with, with, with small group uh, guiding and come up and, and be here with them. Thank you.
if you want, if you want a couple chairs, we can, yeah. All right. If people, if people want, because uh, sometimes the bench is a little bit difficult to have conversation, if you want to just take a spot in the aisle where you're sitting uh, on the floor if you want to do that, or if you, you know, if you would like to do that, it's more conducive to conversation, please feel free to do that. The Blessed Sacrament's not exposed. We don't have it here right now. So if you, if you want to move to a place that's more comfortable for you, everybody to see each other and to talk, that's fine, okay? Hello. Mm -hmm. Huh? Challenge. Yeah, this just struggles with it.
All right. Well, we'll start coming back together and we'll get ready for Q&A and adoration. Yeah. All right. Well, while we're waiting for folks to come back in, was there anybody who wanted to share any cool prayer experience or testimony that they had just to experience in the power of prayer? I got the mic. Oh, who has microphones? Oh, you got things. If you want, if you, want you can raise your hand and bring a microphone to you. Because it's cool. When God does something, it's good that we share it because it lets people know that God's still alive today. He didn't just do stuff for the Israelites a couple thousand years ago like he's doing stuff today, right? So if something really neat happened to you or, or somebody that you know that you wanted to share, you can do that. Or you can just Q&A if you have a question, you just raise hand either way. So, yeah. uh, so this morning there was an answer to prayer in our family. Um, my granddaughter's here and she accidentally ate a, it's not chapstick, it, it's kind of a healing stick, but it had beeswax mm. and olive oil and St. John's wort in it. And she actually ate it uh. yesterday. And so she was feeling sick. She already had a kind of a cold and coughing stuff anyway, but then on top of that, she had that. And so she kind of stopped eating and we were a little concerned. And this morning we were also praying for my father-in-law who had a procedure in the hospital this morning. And in that text thread, I said, oh, and please pray for the grandbaby. Five minutes later, this baby who had been crying and whining and clinging to mom and not eating, got down, was crawling around the house, happy, feeling good, ate the rest of the day, was fine, and all better. So That's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Good. Great. If you have a question or if you have something you want to share, you can raise your hand. I'll just read. I had a couple questions from the the can, the question can, so we can start with those while we get, if you have one, you can raise your hand, that way they're prepared for you. Uh, the next one, this is the question is, what age do you think someone should start dating? Ooh, father's dating advice, are you sure? Okay, <laughs> do you want to go there? Oh, let's go kids, let's do it, yeah. 25, no, just kidding, <laughs> no, no. Um, so, so it's funny because in our house, we had a no dating till you're 16 policy, okay? So that was our parents' rule. You couldn't date till you're 16. And then I heard the call when I was 16, so I actually never dated anybody. So my dating advice is pretty scant, but I will say I didn't miss it because I watched a lot of people date and I saw a lot of mistakes happen when they were younger. I would happen to say that it's probably not a good idea to exclusively date somebody until you're like a senior in high school or a junior, maybe, right? Because, because the fact is, is there's so many changes happening in your brain right now. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that you can't make good decisions. Like, you're not gonna make good decisions. You aren't. Like, it's just, it's, the fact of the matter is we don't know what you want right now. And so it's a, bad, I, it's a bad place to be to start exclusively dating somebody when you don't know what you want. In my mind, if you're not ready to get married, you shouldn't start dating. Because that's where dating leads, right? And if it's not leading there, then you're wasting your time, right? So you should only start dating when you are thinking, I would like to get married, okay? So if this person is a loser and not somebody you would like to be your husband or your wife, do not date him or her because you are wasting your time. Do not do it, right? So if you can't make that decision, you are too young to date. There you go. Now, parents, padres, necesitan instruir a tus niños en la edad para tener novios o novias. Okay, very good. Because that's not my responsibility, but it is the father's responsibility to make sure that they are taking care of you, to make sure that you're not dating a loser. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> because whether you are young or old, you can still be dating a loser. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that true, ladies? Yes. Very good. Do not, I'm telling you, do not date a loser. Don't do it. I'm telling you, like, it's, it's like, but he's so cute. Don't do it. It's a trap. <laughs> do not do it. 
only date somebody who you could see being a good husband or wife and somebody who would be responsible with children. I'm dead serious. So many people come to me after they have been married a couple of years and they cry to me about how their husband or their wife is a terrible, terrible person with the kids. It was so nice when we were just by ourselves. And then we have the kids and like he's never here. He's doing all this stuff. Why didn't you pay attention when you were dating? Right? It, it, it because, because the fact is so many of us, we just rush into marriage. We rush into dating and we don't have a plan. We don't ask important questions. We need to ask important questions. What do you want to do with your life? Are you just wanting to have fun or do you want to raise a family? You need to ask these questions because they don't want to raise a family. Don't marry them. They're just playing with you. That's Father Mark's free advice for today (laughs) about dating. Other thing, remember this. When you do start dating, remember this. They don't have any right to your body whatsoever. If they ask for rights to your body to do things to you that you do not feel comfortable with or even things you might feel comfortable with but it's not listed to do, do not date them anymore. Dump them. They are wolves trying to get what they can from you. I'm dead serious. If they're asking for pictures, if they're asking for inappropriate conversation, if they're asking for inappropriate touching, any of that, you drop them like they're hot. Because if you don't, your heart will be broken. There are a lot of people out there who are just children trying to take what they can. And there's not a lot of grown-ups who really are willing to lay down their life. Look at the example of love here. When they say, oh, if you love me, you'll do this. Look, if you love me, you'll do this. That's the truth. If you love me, you'll lay down your life for me. Are you willing to do that? Oh, sure, baby, I'll do whatever you want. No! (laughs) Liar! I won't believe you until you put a ring on it and you're in the church and you actually exchange the vows, not just put a ring on it and do whatever you want. You got to come here and get the marriage blessed in the church and make the promise for God and witnesses before you give them an inch of who you are. Do you understand? They don't have any right. The way we date is so stupid and toxic. It is horrible. It's not training anybody for marriage. It's training people for divorce. Got to date differently, people. I could give another talk about that, but that's, that's not the topic for tonight. It's Joshua. Any questions about Joshua? <laughs> you getting hot in here or what? <laughs> okay. Father's dating advice. Hey, if we want to have this class on father's dating advice, I'm happy to do that class. That's great. <laughs> Woo, let it go. All right. Any other questions? Hand raise. All right. All right. What, what, what is that weird scorpion-human hybrid in Revelation? Does it exist due to the fact that the devil can only twist God's creation? Also, if we have a guardian angel, can we have something similar but evil, like the little devil with angel shoulders? Wow, and even drew a picture. <laughs> I appreciate the extensive question. Um, uh, I don't know what's with the scorpion-human hybrid in Revelation. Uh, or I don't know what they're referring to. Are you referring to? They might be referring to Revelation uh, 12 uh, with the dragon with seven heads and ten horns and all of that, if that's what they're talking about, um, which is an image of the devil, which is a symbolic representation, right? Because it's revealing the fullness of evil, right, and all of that. Um, so I, I'm not positive. Without knowing the exact scripture, I'm not exactly sure what they're referring to. Um, but the fact is, is that we do have a guardian angel. It's given to us by God. We don't have a guardian devil, Okay. But the fact of the matter is, is that the enemy is, in fact, out to get you. He's out to get me. He wants to corrupt us. That's why we have a guardian angel, to protect us. There's three powers. Remember, we learn this well, friends. A human being is a body and a soul together, okay? And your soul has three powers. It has the power of memory, which allows you to remember things, the power of intellect that allows you to reason about things, and the will so you can choose things, Okay. Your intellect and your memory can be affected by the angels. They can propose ideas to your mind. They can propose memories to your mind. That's how you can get visions, dreams, even remember things that are uh, traumatic or not traumatic. You can remember things in a bad way, right? Sometimes the devil torments us with our memories, right? In a particular light, in the worst possible light. But the guardian angels can also do the same. So if you have difficulty remembering stuff for your tests, ask your guardian angel to help you because he can help your memory. Pro tip, ask your guardian angel to help you, but also study, okay? (laughs) But remember, while the angels can affect your memory and your intellect, they cannot make you do anything. They can't affect your will. There's only one 
who can change your will, and that's God, and he chooses not to do it. That's your, inten- your freedom that you have, is you can always choose the good, even if you're being bombarded all day long by bad thoughts. You can still choose the good. Right? So that's the power you have. So you need to choose to use your will to serve him rather than the enemy. Okay, good. Other questions? we got room for one more, I think, before we start uh, adoration. So if you've got a burning question. Yes. So in the book of Joshua, they destroyed many cities and kings and killed many individuals. What was the reason behind that instead of doing as Jesus did in the New Testament, going out, preaching to them and bringing them to serve the Lord instead of destroying them? Great question. Uh, it's complicated, but the, the main answer is, have you seen the Israelites? They can't even stay faithful. How in the world are they going to convince anyone else to do it? This is the real problem, right? They have the law, but not the power to carry it out. They are so consumed by their passions, they can't even get it right themselves, much less be a good witness to anybody else. So they're in spiritual infancy, and that's the truth of the matter, is that they don't have the grace of the Holy Spirit to help them live this way, and they show themselves that if they're not in an incubator, they're going to die. If they're not in a greenhouse, they're going to die, right? If they get exposed to the wind, right, they fall over. That's the history of Israel, is that they're so weak, even though they have 40, day, 40 years, every day, bread from heaven. Remember that, 40 years of every day oh my gosh it's bread from heaven again here we go what are we having for breakfast today bread from heaven what about tomorrow bread from heaven what are we having every day for 40 years and they still disobey god and they want to go back to egypt so how are those people going to evangelize not going to happen right so so it's a practical reason uh the other is a spiritual reason to say that again as we mentioned the book of joshua is an analogy for the spiritual life when you're going to the promised land you're following jesus who is going into the world, right, and delivering everything. You look at what Jesus does first. He goes into the Jordan River, right, and he's baptized in the Jordan. So he's the new Joshua who enters into the Jordan River, and then the whole waters are sanctified, and then he goes into the desert for 40 days, and he fasts. So he recapitulates in his person the experience of Israel, the 40 years in the desert, and he's faithful where they were unfaithful. So he's showing you, I'm the new Joshua. I'm leading you into the promised land, and everywhere I go, the enemy is being destroyed. Demons are being driven out. Sick people are being healed. Everything is happening for a reason because he's fulfilling all the types that Joshua was doing. Wherever Joshua went, he was victorious. Wherever Jesus goes, he's victorious, right? But even better than the old Joshua because those battles didn't last, like their victories didn't last. But Jesus is the king whose victories will last forever and ever, right? So not, a, not an easy answer. The fact of the matter is, is that we don't know ultimately, but the fact is, is that it's a teaching. It's a divine pedagogy. He's teaching us through experience that we can't do this on our own. We need grace to do it. And we need the real Yeshua to come and give us divine power. Good. There's lots more. Um, we could go a lot more on that. Your homework for next week is Judges and Ruth. I want to give you a key, though, because Judges is very brutal, okay? There's lots of great stories, but there's also really horrific stuff in there and you're gonna be like oh my gosh uh, so I just want to give you it's rate it's a rated PG-13 book for the violence right and actually one of the stories in there is definitely rated R okay so uh, maybe if parents want to read through that first and just decide okay the later chapters toward the end there's a particularly horrific story and your atheists use this book to try and disprove Christianity or a good God. So I'm gonna give you the key for understanding Judges. Remember this well, it's in the very first part of the book of Judges, all right? And I'm I'm gonna read it to you so that you hear it, but if you turn with me to Judges chapter one, this will be the interpretive key as you're reading through it. Remember this phrase, okay? Sorry, no, uh, I, I can't find it here, but it's at the end, the very end of the book of Judges. For sure, I, I, I wasn't prepared to do this, but... Okay, the very last verse of the book of Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. It says so in the beginning of the book, and it says so at the end of the book. I can't remember where it's in the beginning of the book. 
But the fact is, that's the key. This, everything you're going to read about in Judges is the consequence of what happens when everyone does their own thing and doesn't do what God tells them to. Okay, that makes sense? So when you read about all the horrible stuff, realize that's what happens when everyone does what they think is right. Sound good? Let's get prepared for adoration. If someone can help me with uh, moving, uh, if, if a couple people can help me to move this to the side, thank you. O salutari sostia, qui celipandi sostium, bella premunt hostilia, da rober fer auxilium, unitrino que domino, sit sempiterna gloria, Qui vitam sine termino, nobis donet in patria. Amen. Lord Jesus, true Joshua who sets us free from sin and leads us to the promised land, we ask that you would fill us with grace this week. Help us to pray so we would overcome every enemy of our soul and that we would have your peace. Blessed Mother, we ask that you would surround us with your mantle and draw us deeply into your Son's embrace. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. The Lord is here every day, every night, 24 hours a day. If you need a key for adoration, we're happy to get you one. But I would encourage all of us, we need to pray. We need to make the time for him as we do so. Our hearts will be open more to his truth and we'll have more peace in our hearts. So I invite all of you to make a commitment to do that this week to the degree you can. <laughs> 